And that shows you how big Boogie is, because Morris can barely move him over. <laughs> so, no, by the way, Boogie. Fizz, are you, are you breaking up that fight? I'm right. not breaking up that <laughs> no, fight. I'm not breaking up any fight. Are you kidding me? That's nope. always the guy that gets knocked out, <laughs> come running in trying to break something up. I'm going to let them tire themselves <laughs> out, and then I'll slide in. <laughs> nope, nope. Also, no, but should note, be noted, Boogie did have to leave the game after a flagrant two on the prime later. So, hey. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols alongside The Jump's resident head coach and a man with two rings, Mr. David Fisdale, and the host of the Hoop Collective podcast, New York Times bestseller from the Cobra Dome, Brian Windhorst. Coming up, the Warriors <laughs> finding a way to win despite a freezing cold night from Steph. Is that something, nothing, or everything? We will play one of our favorite games. First, though, how much bad stuff can you live with to still get some of the good? That has been the question facing not just sports leagues, but every person, every family, and yes, every business in this country since this whole global pandemic started. Is it really worth it to take that trip out to the grocery store? Most people think yes. What about to go to work? Well, your answer probably changes depending on how much you need that job to make rent. Or, or what about letting your kid play with a neighbor? What if then the neighbor tests positive for COVID and either you get it too, or even if you don't, you're told that you and your spouse and your kids need to spend a week without leaving your house, just to be sure you're not spreading it. Will that play date have felt worth it? Right now, the NBA is still answering that question with yes, even as the number of affected teams and players mount. Just this afternoon, the league announced that both tonight's Pelicans Mavericks game and Tuesday's Celtics Bulls game were being postponed due to COVID issues. The third and fourth such postponements of this three week old NBA season. And the number of players across the league who are in COVID related protocols is mushrooming. 11 on Wednesday, 15 on Thursday, now it jumps to 26 on Friday, 27 on Sunday. We're still getting the full count from today. Here's Brad Stevens walking off the court yesterday after the Celtics Heat game had to be postponed. That game was called due to COVID issues on the Miami side. But I'm guessing the postponement was actually a relief to the Celtics, who as of yesterday only had eight players available themselves. Now that would have actually technically have been enough. NBA rules this season say if you got eight, you have to take the court and play. Because frankly, they need to get games in and eight is where they've drawn the line on the bare minimum to make that possible. But of course, that is not sitting well with everyone. Take what happened Saturday with the Sixers. After COVID and its accompanying precautions ripped through the Philadelphia locker room, Doc Rivers said he didn't think the team should be playing. That going ahead with only eight or nine guys would cause too much wear and tear on the players who were on the court, including stars like Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Now the league disagreed, so the Sixers ended up holding Embiid and Simmons out of that day's game against Denver anyway, listing them with minor injuries, bringing their number of healthy bodies to seven. Maybe they were hoping that would trigger a postponement, but it didn't since neither the injuries to Simmons nor Embiid had previously been reported to the league. A and look, I don't know the exact conversation between the team and league officials, but to outside eyes, the message from the NBA sure seemed to be, hey, we know no team wants to only play games that count in the standings with a severely undermanned team, but you can't just force a postponement by sitting a couple extra players to get under that eight benchmark. It's a message the NBA further amplified this afternoon when it fined Philadelphia 25 grand in relations to Simmons sitting. And if you think all of this has caused some rankling in team front offices, you would be correct. Our Adrian Wojnarowski reports that one general manager told ESPN, quote, they tell us it will be better later in this season, but I just hope this doesn't break the league in the next few weeks. Now, Woj also reports there is now a special Board of Governors meeting happening tomorrow and that the league's GMs are scheduled to have a conference call today to go over whether protocols should be further tightened. For example, right now on road trips, players are allowed to have a guest or two from that city visit their hotel room. It's supposed to be a family member or close friend. I don't know how much longer that's going to be allowed. There's also new scrutiny on players from opposing teams hugging or talking without masks after a game. Still, bottom line, at least right now, the NBA is expected to tell teams the league is moving forward, even if the competitive balance is a mess, even if the stop-start nature of the protocols leaves some players more vulnerable to injury. After all, this isn't just a play date. This is an eight to $10 billion a year business. The effects of just shutting down until players are vaccinated would be catastrophic to that business, both short and long term. When those diving for their fainting couches today say, oh, this is about the money. Yeah, 
Absolutely. <laughs> it is about the money. Pro sports have always been about the money, and you are perfectly within your rights to be disgusted with that if you choose. But it's also the reason the NFL, Major League Baseball, college football played through postponements and positive tests. It's just that the degree of difficulty was always going to be harder for the NBA, which plays several games a week indoors with fewer bodies available per team in what now is the absolute worst spike of this virus. So should the NBA go back to a bubble? Good luck convincing players to be locked away from their families for the next eight months. Should the league expand rosters? Seems like it. Should the guidance change on how teams hold in-person meetings and practices or whether they hold them at all? Maybe. For those who made fun of Allen Iverson about practice all those years ago, the Cleveland Browns would like a word. <laughs> the hard reality is that all NBA teams, all they have faced so far in this short season, it is going to continue, probably getting worse before it gets better, as long as the league plays basketball in a pandemic. Is it worth it? So far, the league and its players say yes. So, Brian, what should the NBA do now? So they're going to have to adopt some changes, Rachel, because while there definitely are positive tests happening, we know of a lot of them, uh, what's really causing games to be postponed is the contact tracing. When one player gets a confirmed test, and then all of a sudden they have to put six or seven players into a contact tracing protocol. So the idea here would be to, to amend some of the day-to-day -day procedures so that you won't have to put as many players in contact tracing. Keep them farther apart, put some more measures in it, maybe not have contact tracing be so long so that you wouldn't have a devastating effect on a team. But there's another message that's going to have to get through. Rachel, there are hundreds of players in this league who have had COVID over the last nine or 10 months. Uh, there are certain teams that have had double digits. I've heard at least one team thinks its entire roster uh, has the antibodies. But um, that does not necessarily mean, as we saw with Kevin Durant, who has admitted he had COVID in the past, that you can't uh, be put into contact tracing. And so players may be instructed to change their behavior off the court, away from team facilities, even if they are operating under the belief that they have some protection with COVID, and that's going to be a hard sell as well. Yeah, I mean, this is difficult. This is a this is a difficult circumstance. While COVID is, is peaking at its highest moments right now, I do think that they're going to have to put more protocols in place to try to protect these guys. But at the end of the day, I think people are just going to get it. Um, you know, it's just inevitable. Uh, it's too many different layers to it to where people have contact and, and can possibly, you know, contract it. And so I think teams are going to have to keep, you know, really being strict with their players. Players have to be pros about this to make sure that everyone's staying healthy in the building. And, and ultimately, we're going to see postponed games. That's just going to be part of the deal. But I do think they're going to keep moving forward. And eventually, maybe, by the time we get to the playoffs, you may see another bubble then. And now we get everybody in the building like we did in Disney last year, which went off amazing. Uh, but I think they got to get to that point. And look, if you want to be high in the standings, if this is important to you to go after this championship, then you have to make sacrifices about where you go and who you interact with. And if teams aren't taking care of business and their whole team is getting COVID, then somebody or multiple people on that team is not really serious about what they're doing and not being professional. So I do think the league has to be very strict about this and they have to get a hold on this so that we can move forward with a successful season. And it's an important distinction, right? Look, people who test positive for COVID haven't necessarily done anything wrong. There are so many people I know who have tried to do everything the right way, and, and this virus creeps in. That but. is how this works. <laughs> but. but there is also a matter of, hey, you can try to mitigate your risk. And your point about yeah. having to sacrifice goes to exactly to what Brian was just saying, the idea that in players' personal lives especially, do you? And I'm not talking about crazy stuff. I'm not talking about wildly irresponsible stuff. I'm talking about the same stuff the rest of us are all grappling with. Hey, we haven't had a barbecue in six months. Can we finally have one? It's outside. Hey, my kid really is desperate for just some human contact. They want to play with their friends. Th these are things that all Americans are dealing with every day as this spike in coronavirus cases. Wow. I can't even call it a spike anymore. Just the way cases continue to mushroom in this country yep. are dealing with. And the level of sacrifices that play Players may be asked to make from here on out to mitigate some of the contact tracing issues that Brian is talking about. Kevin Durant, the example he gave, a friend or family member having a positive test is what caused him to sit 
right, for those days, even though he already had COVID, even though he did test to still have antibodies now. We don't know enough to have him just mix with the rest of the team, so he had to sit. And it's going to be harder and harder for players to just live their daily lives. And to your point, Fizz, they have to decide, is it worth it? It's what I started the show with. Right. Is it worth it? We are all having to decide over and over again every day with every interaction we have, is it worth it? And it, of course, extends to what Doc Rivers was upset about. Yes. In that Philly game Saturday against the Nuggets, the seven players who played, three played more than 40 minutes, including rookie Tyrese Maxey, who scored 39. <laughs> Doc explained before the game his concern about any of his players playing that much. Take a listen. I'm more concerned with health on the floor. You know, we're going to play players tonight that haven't played a lot of minutes. You know, um, I'm not going to, you know, so like when you got seven bodies, this someone's going to have to play 40 plus minutes. And so, and that's not just for today. That's long-term health, you know, with the accumulation of games. You know, it's the, the numbers we want to stay away from with our players. All right. So, Fizz, you know Doc's pain. You've had to manage minutes in your time Absolutely. as a head coach. What would your concerns be when faced with the same situation as Doc? He's hitting it on the head. I mean, the one thing I think all of us coaches have become over the last few years is like sports scientists, right. like, like unofficially, right? So we have learned that there is a science to the fact that if a guy is playing so many minutes, say five minutes a game, low minute guy, and all of a sudden he jumps up to 40 minutes a night playing competitive NBA basketball against the best players in the world, that could lead to injury, especially over cumulative nights. And so he's right. And so again, the league is going to have to figure out how do we work this so that one, we're protecting our players from COVID, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're protecting our players on the court from getting serious injuries, you know, pulls, you know, uh, twists, things like that, that can have you out for a whole year, for six months, things like that. And so, yes, Doc is right. When you're a coach, you're trying to manage all of this. And when you got seven guys, you really don't have a choice. Most of those guys are going to play close to 40 plus minutes. And that's just the situation that you're yeah, in. When they, came, when they came up with this eight player rule, mm -hmm. it wasn't in the COVID era. And maybe, maybe <laughs> it would happen one time or two times a year in the entire NBA. And maybe it would just happen for one night because a guy or two had a, had a twisted ankle or, or, or was under the weather for one day. This, this rule, this eight player rule was not built for contact tracing that lasts seven days. And so there's really only two options. You're either gonna have to reevaluate the contact tracing rules as a result of new protocol, or they're gonna have to consider expanding the rosters, which they've already done a little bit of by allowing 10-day uh, contracts, which they don't usually allow at this point in the season. Uh, we've seen a couple of teams sign hardship players. Before this uh, season started, Rachel, the NBA kicked around ex extending the amount of two-way players from two per team to four per team, or even you know negotiate to three. They ended up not doing that. They may have to relook at that to yes. see, to give a little bit of more of a buffer. Yeah, and, and look, that's complicated too, right, Brian? Because I, I was I was listening to the Hoop Collective podcast on the way into work <laughs> today. It's excellent. I recommend it to everyone. And you and ben, uh, Tim Bontemps and Royce Young were discussing a team like Boston had 14 players available when they went to bed and eight players available when they wake up the next day because of contact tracing concerns. And so you couldn't get... Even if you had those expanded rosters, right, could you get the guys you would need in the right place at the right time for the game? Well, you might be able to, but you can't just sign the guy off the street. Like in the past, we've seen guys sign at 10 a.m. and start at 7.30. Now a player would have to go through a quarantine. You can't just sign them. So even getting a new player takes days. So you would ideally like to have those players healthy. Uh, but again, if they're ensnared in contract tracing, you're in the same you're in the same boat. You know, the Major League Baseball had this sort of taxi squad where they had like guys located down the road sort of playing simulated games and that helped them grease the skids. I don't know if the NBA could look at something like that, but the G League is headed towards a bubble and even that has issues because even if you plucked players out of the bubble who are playing well and healthy and ready and, and in shape, they would have to quarantine because they'd have to travel from Orlando to join the team wherever they are. This is just really complicated. The league is going day by day. Yep, and of course, if you do expand the rosters and those guys are in your traveling party, it means that you might be more open to contact tracing issues because that's one more guy who might be bringing COVID into the group. It is complicated. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about Wolves from Saturday. First, DeMar DeRozan going down the lane for the Okay, D. 
Ooh, nice. Touch and one. So Ooh. Fizz, which is more impressive? That was a pretty impressive play right, right. there. I mean, off the. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, I'm going with the dunk, though. Back. That, yeah. The, the behind the back. I mean, that's tough. That's tough. That off the good. wrong leg. Put that English on the ball so it spin off the glass, but I like that. I like in traffic, over the top. Boom. That's nice. <laughs> I mean, that was powerful, but, it, you know, the dribble approach was great. <laughs> I, I like can't it, either, so they impress both. I like it. Both, both impress me. This dehydration. <laughs> Kawhi shed the mask and dropped 21 third quarter points, and the Clippers come from behind win. He also held two water bottles at once. This was not Paul Pierce style. He actually held them in his hand. One hand, two water yeah. bottles That's at ridiculous. one time. Brian, why hold one when you can hold two, right? Well, Rachel, this appears to be sparkling and and flat, and that everybody knows a good meal, you should have a bottle of both. I can't even get uh, my hand around this entire cup. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, the guy just had two water bottles holding in his hand. I mean, that is unbelievable. <laughs> I actually go. think he could hold more than so two. Unfair. So unfair. I think unfair. he could hold three or four. That's just... Yeah, that's wrong. Make <laughs> he had finger slack. And the dexterity. Slack Say that four yeah, times fast. Lakers Rockets off the miss. LeBron snaring it with his left. Hurls the pass up to KCP for the finish. Fizz, what would LeBron average if he just played with his left hand? You coached him for four years. <laughs> That's if he ridiculous. just played with his left. You know what? He still probably have pretty dang good numbers. I'm not going to lie. I mean, he, he, he's so talented. He's still going to get to the rim. He's still going to go by people. He still can throw passes with either hand. So he'd still be probably an all-star. <laughs> Well, as we all know, he is left-handed. He plays basketball right-handed, but he is left-handed. So I would say a lot, a lot of points this and a lot of rebounds. <laughs> this was my question. I mean, again, I mean, look had at the that. Ben Simmons conversation. <laughs> Not only did he throw it his left hand, it was You perfect. should better ask, how many yards could he have thrown against the Steelers last night? That oh, is a question. I knew that was left coming. Hand. or a call. <laughs> <laughs> Miss defense, Nuggets Nick, Jokic running out of time, running out of options. So he's like, oh. Maybe I'll just oh my do this. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Fizz, I mean, big time shot for Big Honey. Big Honey, is that a... That, that I was, got a tough one. That off. nickname That's picked good. up steam in the last week, big and I have honey. come out on the show strongly <laughs> that he should continue with the Joker as opposed to Big yeah, Honey. Yeah, I can't but, call it. Big Honey. Come on, man. But that's a tough shot. You shoot over Mitchell Robinson. I mean, a bona fide 7-1 shot blocker right Mitchell there. Robinson after this game said <laughs> defending him wasn't actually that hard. Oh. No. He said that. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, he did everything he could do right there, right? I mean, <laughs> much of the NBA. It was good defense, I will admit. Yeah. It doesn't seem to agree, but there you go. Big honey. It's just Big not acceptable honey. to me. I'm just, I don't know. I'm going to have some problems with this big team. <laughs> Make terror. Hawks Hornets. Terry Rozier going behind oh. the back. Oh. Drives in and slams it. Come on. Ryan, which was better, the move or the finish? I thought we were getting to this right off the top of Maker Miss. Well, the move was in the move was incredible, but he finishes so strongly that he falls down. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he wasn't even ready for that power of that jam. So I guess I gotta go with the jam because it surprised even him. And look, he didn't nobody wanted none of that action down there. I'll tell you that. When he loaded up. <laughs> I mean, Where is everybody else at? Somebody got to go challenge that, right? I, too, would have made. So, again. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be on that poster when you got a point guard going to the rim and, and you jump up there and make a mistake and now you're on Terry Rozier's wall. You don't want that, do you? <laughs> All right. So, that, given that inspirational video you have just been watching, it is time to run it back to the best move dunk combos ever. Honorable mention oh. only because it was preseason. Oh, Kobe on Ben Wallace goodness. in 97. Come on. Where is that at? Thomas and Mac? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it that is. Me. I just want to tell you the greatest montages Ooh. we've ever had in this show. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let you guys watch it. <laughs> oh, my This goodness. is an incredible montage that you're about to watch. <laughs> Let's go for Brian's Mamba. turn kit monitor isn't working. Oh, Number I remember five. this. I was there for this one. Derek oh. versus the Heat in 2011. Fizz, what did it feel like? <laughs> we could not believe it. He was such a pain in our butt. The guy had rockets. You couldn't contain him off the dribble. And then when he got in there, that was a possibility. And Joel Anthony was our best dang shot blocker. That year's MVP, number four. Yeah, but Vince. you won the game 
You won the game in the series. <laughs> Vince versus the Lakers, 2001. You could show 50 of these for Vince. I'm sure yes. he's got like a whole reel of these. There's the move, and there's the finish. The best part about this clip, you can't hear it, is that Chick Hearn freaks out when he sees it. Chick <laughs> Hearn was blown away by it. The great Chick Hearn, baby. Kobe against the Come Cubs, on, Cole, Cole. Mamba is just, come on, man. A little look afterward. That's seriously like he's in slow motion. Like, that's how he sees the game right there. That slow mo. Mm -hmm. Man, we gonna miss him. Goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. mm, number two, Dwayne Wade versus oh, yeah. Thunder. Oh, yeah, I was there for that, too. You're on the bench for that one, too, man. <laughs> I was there for that one, too. Oh, my goodness. Did we go off when we saw that? <laughs> he was another guy, I'm telling you. He always says he's 6'5". He's about 6'3". Mm-hmm. But that's why I was always impressed with his dust, because he is about 6'3". <laughs> I hope he's watching this right now. Number one, Michael Oh, no, Jordan Pat. Versus the oh, no. 1991. Oh, man. So How sorry. does he do this? I, mean, I still don't know what happened here. No, he, the illegal defensive rules. He came over to trap the box. Oakley thought he was dribbling <laughs> out. And he hit him with the spin. <laughs> mm. oh, I was in seventh grade, just so you know. <laughs> the answer, Brian, how did he do that? How did he do anything? He's Michael Jordan. Exactly. Boom. All right, guys, stick with us. Coming up, KD returning from quarantine on Sunday, but the Nets still fell below 500 as they wait to get back to full strength. What is the level of concern in Brooklyn? We will catch you up right after this break. Nichols joined here in Los Angeles by Coach David Fisdale, remotely by our friend insider Brian Windhorst. Let's talk about the Brooklyn Nets, gentlemen. They lost to the Thunder at home last night, although again, I'm going to say it, throwback Eunice, happy. Kevin Durant <laughs> scored 36 points in his return to the lineup after a three-game absence due to the league's COVID protocols. Kyrie Irving, still out, missed the last three games due to undisclosed personal reasons, and Steve Nash had no update for the media on him today. So, Coach, what is your level of concern for the Nets after a 5-6 and six start? I'm kind of torn on it, right? Like, I do have a lot of concern. I've always had the same concerns of health mm -hmm. was always the big one. You know, Dinwiddie, three games he's only played. Uh, uh, KD and Kyrie and now, have played, and now he's out. Yep. And KD and Kyrie, seven games apiece. And so that was always my big concern anyway about them. Uh, I, I, I remember when we brought the big three together mm -hmm. and, and we started off 9-8. and eight. And it was all kind of stuff in the air, Did right? Did that get and public attention? I bet. Oh, it was a mess. I I oh, yeah. Way more was remembers. It was. Daily breathless Oh, updates. my goodness. You would have thought the world was coming to an end. But we won 22 out of 23 after yes, that. Yes, I do. And this team too. has that kind of talent. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm just hoping for the best for Kyrie and that he gets back on the court fast because, again, all of us wants to see this team playing together and them exciting the league and, and showing what they can do. Yeah. Yeah, Coach, you're so right. I mean, health is going to define how this team goes, especially because Kyrie and Durant have availability has been, you know, in question. But to me, I still think their biggest thing they've got to wrestle with is defense. And I know that their yes. defensive numbers don't look so bad, but, you know, fundamentally, they are a, a, a suspect defensive team. The Oklahoma City Thunder, who are not a juggernaut, even though they have a better record than the Nets right now, had 66 points in the paint in this game. That is not allowable. You just can't do it. And, you know, again, 129 points they give up. I know they've got a great offense, but especially when they don't have full power, when Kyrie is out, you can't go out there and get into a scoring match. And they have yet to prove on a night-in, night-out basis that they can defend at the level to be a championship team. And to me, that's going to be the story the whole season. And look, anybody who's been watching the NBA for 10 minutes knows there is a huge difference between what gives you good or acceptable numbers in the regular season versus what happens during the playoffs and whether you get eaten up and spit out by your opponents. We saw a regular season versus playoffs issue with the Milwaukee Bucks this past season. We see it every year, and that is exactly what Brian is talking about. All right, Carl Anthony Towns returned to the Wolves lineup Saturday. I want to give that some attention. He missed six straight games with a wrist injury. Obviously, an incredibly difficult season for him overall. He scored 25 points in his return. Now, he did sit out Sundays back-to-back -back as a precaution, according to the team. <coughs> Brian, what impact do you think Cat's return has on the Wolves' season going forward? Because they're not going anywhere without him, but even with him, what do you see? All right. Yeah, I mean, they're already teetering um, with where their record is. And Carl Towns said that when he first saw the doctor with this wrist injury, which is a, a strange, a dislocated bone in his wrist, I can't say I've seen it or even heard about it very often. He, they told him he was looking at six to eight weeks. Ooh. If he was out six weeks, 
I think the Timberwolves would have been done. And I mean, they are yeah. already, like I said, in a gray zone, you know, at this point. Uh, so he he's pushing it, coming back at two weeks. Now he put up good numbers in his first game. He said he doesn't have great feeling in that hand, and he doesn't have, you know, that hand is not really that functional. But if he can put up those numbers, he's given them a chance. And then coming back now, um, you know, it's a move. We'll see whether or not it pays off for them. But um, you know, he was supposed to be out a month longer. Mm. Yeah, and I just think, one, they can, he'll galvanize them. Mm -hmm. I mean, after everything that they've gone through, I think the team will rally around him. I think with him, they're a fringe playoff team, maybe. Like, they really got to play well, but without him, no, the there's West. no chance. And it's like I said, it's tough in the West. So even with him, I think it's very difficult for them to get into the dance. But he is just a huge factor for them. I think his whole, you know, purpose right now is to honor his mom, honor his family, play with great joy, find something every day to appreciate in her honor. And, and you know, hopefully his team will rally around him and we can see some exciting basketball come out of Minnesota. Yeah, it's still incredibly hard. He has talked about the fact that, you know, look, I can't just lose myself in basketball. Some people can do that after a right. huge loss. He said, that's not it. He said, every time I step on the court, all I think about is my mom's not here. Yeah. And, and I just, I have such admiration for him going forward with everything that he and so many Americans have been through this past year, dealing with deaths due to coronavirus. Um, and I think I think it is going to be tough for that team. It's such a shame because the high expectations I know that they had, especially getting Kat and D'Lo together in the first place, mm -hmm. they sort of mapped out what they wanted the next two to three years to look like. And this is certainly not happening right now. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Mavericks. Kristaps Porzingis expected to make his debut today, but that was before Mavericks Pelicans was postponed. He has been recovering from meniscus surgery. Now, Fizz, the Mavs currently in the middle of the pack in the West with a 5-4 and four record. Does the return of a healthy unicorn put them in the upper echelon of the conference? Absolutely. It's no question about this. This, First off, how good is Luka? Let's just put that out there. 5-4 <laughs> and four in the West, no Chris Stapps. Yep. And Dallas has a good basketball team surrounding them. I don't want to just say it it's like it's just sure. them. But Chris Stapps Porzingis showed when he's on the team and when he's on, out there playing for them, you saw in the Clippers series, how big was that to have him out there? Sure. He was ejected, totally different deal. When yep. he went out with the injury, totally different deal. If he was in that series, they might have had a chance to really win that series, and I'm not stretching on that. So him being that stretch set, that seven-footer, that defensive guy at the rim with Luka Doncic, definitely in the top pack, mm -hmm. uh, top of the pack in the West. Yeah, are they a, are they a, a high-level team with, with Porzingis? Yes. Are they a championship contender? I still think they're a piece away, and I think mm -hmm. they know that, which is why they've cleared out cap space and why they you know, had dreams of Giannis, those had, um, and, and why they may look in the trade market, whether it's during the season or in the summer. It doesn't have to be another all-star player, but I still think they need another high-level piece. Now, we still don't really know what the ceiling for Luka is. Um, and Rick Carlisle has been a little bit disappointed with their, their level of focus early in the season. They can improve that, and they're better with Porzingis. I think they're dangerous, but I don't think they're where they need to be. And, and look, those two guys are young and signed to long-term contracts. They have runway. Let's see what they do. And, and, of course, this is another team where, again, their game was canceled. Sorry, not canceled. The game was postponed tonight. Having COVID issues affect the team can affect your record in a shortened season. Every game is one of 72, not one of 82. Maxi Kleba had been playing lights out for them, and now he is going to be off the board for a while. So that will also affect which echelon they end up in.